Bible study. Our scripture tonight will come from Romans, the 8th chapter, and verse number 28. Romans 8 and 28. And it says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his a special way that's why I praise you and I that's why my son is filled with prayer Father God we thank you again Father for just being good and being God we thank you Lord for blessing us one more time to come to the house of prayer, the house of worship, the house where you bear your name. God, we thank you, Lord, for blessing us, Father God, to come before your presence. We realize, Father, we are not worthy. We realize that we fall short. We do not do the things that are pleasing in your sight. We realize that we miss the mark and miss the target. But God, we thank you for forgiving us. 
for blessing us and keeping us. Now, Lord, we come tonight to study your word. We pray that you bless us through your word, that your word will become real to us, that your word will leave the pages, that your word will land in our heart, that your word, Father God, will make us different, and that we will tell others about the goodness of Jesus the Christ. Lord, we thank you for this privilege. We thank you for this honor. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Now we ask you to bless us with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that your word, Father God, will speak to us, that we will do what your word says to do. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory, all the honor and all the praise, allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. So in the strong, mighty, powerful, anointed name of Jesus Christ, we pray, and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. Praise you. I lift you up. That's why. It's feel praise. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Thank God that He is able and He has filled our hearts our hearts with praise. Thank you so much for meeting us again for Bible study on tonight. Tonight we are in 3 John. We are in 3 John tonight. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 8 on tonight. 3 John verses 1 through 8. 3 John, the book is 3 John. There is no chapter there. Why is there not a chapter? Because there's only one chapter, right? So um, 3 John, verses 1 through 8 is where we are tonight. Imagine. Imagine trouble on the outside. Imagine struggles on the outside. Imagine trouble, tribulation, on the outside, then imagine trouble, tribulation on the inside. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that you got trouble on the outside and then you have trouble on the inside? Which is worse? Trouble on the inside or trouble on the outside? Which is worse? Trouble on the inside. Why is that worse? Why, why does that make a difference? Huh? Why is that worse? You looking for the Bible, Sister David? Trouble on the inside. Trouble on the outside. Can you identify? Can you identify when, when there's trouble on the outside, there's danger, there's persecution, there is false witness, false doctrine, false teachers on the outside. But today, today John introduces us to not only trouble on the outside. In 1 John, 2 John, he talks about trouble on the outside, how false prophets rose up and false prophets preached false doctrine and they did not obey the apostles' doctrine. But in 3 John, he introduces us to trouble on the inside. My, my, my. Sister Brown, there's trouble in the house, not outside of the house. Can you imagine that you got to deal with issues on the outside and then you got to deal with issues on the, on the inside? That's what the apostle introduces to us tonight. He introduces us to trouble on the inside. Just to give you a little background, the apostle John is writing this particular epistle during a time when the church, the early church, was going through struggles. We already know that they were going through struggles with false prophets trying to get inside and causing trouble on the inside. But now, 
tonight and next Wednesday, we will see that there's a brother on the inside causing trouble. My, my, my. The forces on the outside was pushing on the early church. The forces on the outside was beating and persecuting the early church. But today, John introduces to us that there is harm going on on the inside. The struggles of the church on the outside can be devastating. But when you got struggles in the church on the inside, it could just tear the church asunder. And the apostle, the apostle John says to us today that this local church had struggles, and he writes this letter based on those struggles. He writes this letter because he had a brother in the crowd in the church on the inside that had an arrogant attitude. Y'all don't know anybody like that, do you? Not in the church, right? Not, you know, you, you know some arrogant people, but not in the church, in the church, in the church. What about your church, Sister Brown? You don't know anybody. I didn't think you did. You don't know anybody like that, do you? <laughs> Brother Miles, you know anybody like that with, with, with just an arrogant attitude? I know, you, I know you're going to say not at this church, but at the church around the corner, down the street. Just got an arrogant attitude. There is one brother in this local church that the Apostle John talks about in 3 John. He says that this brother has caused problems on the inside, and therefore he is writing this letter to address it. So the question is, is it anybody's place to address it or just let it happen? Leave him alone. Leave him alone. In the book of Acts, I think it's chapter 5, uh, Gamaliel stood up, Gamaliel stood up, and he said to them, leave these men alone. He's talking about the apostles. Leave them alone. And then he came back with a profound statement. He says, if it's of God, you can't stop it. But if it's not of God, it will come to naught. So Gamaliel says, leave it alone. But if you leave your relationship alone, it will fail. If you leave the school system alone, people get killed. If you leave the community alone, it vanishes away. If you leave the church alone, you get empty seats. So somewhere, sometimes, somebody has to stand up. Somebody has to say something. Somebody has to write a letter, so the Apostle John writes this letter. He begins in one, verse 1 by saying, To the beloved Gainus, some people call him Gaius, Gainus, whom I love in truth. So he be, begins by identifying the fact that he's writing this letter to one of the leaders of the local church. He's writing this letter to Gainus, and, and he begins by complimenting Gainus, a Gaius. He says, beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Be in health. He says, I want you to prosper. This word prosper means that I want you to succeed in life. This word prosper means that I want you to succeed on this journey. This word prosper means that I want you to demonstrate success on this journey. I want you to prosper. We ought to want people to prosper. We ought to just desire to see people. And we ought to desire to see people prosper other than those who we like. Other than those in our family. When someone else is blessed, you ought to rejoice with them. You ought to celebrate with them. You ought to, to beat the drum on their behalf. But some with the wrong attitude get jealous. Some with the wrong attitude throw up their hands, walk away, and they begin to say things like this. Everybody ain't able. What does that mean? What, what are they saying when they say everybody's not able? Everybody, 
Everybody's not able. What, what are they saying? Anybody? Oh, there's a jealous streak. I see. They're jealous. Anything else? What are they saying? Everybody's not able. What, what does that mean? What, what are they saying? Anybody? Anybody? Everybody's not able. Everybody can't do with that person. It, are they celebrating that person when they say that many times? They're usually not celebrating that person. They're usually not celebrating why? We serve a big old God. We, we serve a, a huge God with a whole lot of blessings. Just because somebody is getting blessed, does that mean that God is short on blessings? You don't think so? The God we serve has enough blessings to pass them out. So, so the Apostle John says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper that you may succeed on this journey, that you may be successful in life. He says, not only do I pray that you prosper, I pray that you have success in all things. Saying to Gainus, he says, Gainus, I pray for you, and I'm praying that you have success in everything you put your hands to. I'm praying that God blesses you in every way that you turn around, God just keep on blessing you. Songwriter said, every time I turn around, he just keeps on, he keeps on, he keeps on, he keeps on blessing me. So the Apostle John said, I'm, I'm praying for you just like that. The saints of God ought to pray for each other that we are prosperous and that God keeps blessing us even in spite of us. We ought to pray for each other. Let me tell you, those guys that attacked the Capitol, they were all on one accord. Now, they may lie about it now, but that day, they were all on one accord. I mean, they called people in our neighborhood hoodlums or hoodlums. When I saw them climbing up a brick wall, crawling on scaffolding, with a loose, with a noose outside, those are hoodlums, are hoodlums. <laughs> and even some people from our neighborhood trust to show up. But they all were on one accord. Why can't the church get on one accord? It would be so amazing if everybody in the church Pray for everybody that everybody would prosper. When we see a person going through, we ought to pray for them. We see a couple going through, we ought to pray for them. When you see a child going through, children are so confused these days. I mean, they are just devastatingly confused. We ought to pray for them. In my day, you, I mean, most of you in here can identify because I think I'm the youngest person in the room. Now. In my day, when a girl got pregnant out of wedlock, they didn't put her business on front street. The women of the community would surround that child and they would, they would help that little girl nurture that child to, to health during her pregnancy and afterwards. Now you got children going on Jerry Springer and they fighting and posting stuff. I mean, you got a bubble in front of them that represent seven, eight, nine months, but they're in the streets fighting. And if some senior citizen says something to them, guess what? It's on with them too. He says, I'm praying for you that you prosper. Let me tell you, when you pray for a person in the body of Christ, you're getting blessed also. You know, one reason why we ought to treat other people's children right and we ought to give to other people's children and we ought to support other people's children and what other people's children do, 
Because there's going to come a day where your child is not going to hear you. There's going to come a day, I don't care how much you pour into him. You can quote the scripture that when you raise up a child, he will not depart from it. I don't know what happening. <laughs> These days, I don't know what's happening. God promises <laughs> that they will not depart for it, from it. But there will come a day that, let me say, 98% of our children will not hear us. So we have to pour into somebody else's child now. Pour into them every chance we get because God will bring somebody in our children's path that that child will listen to. You reap what you sow. If you tear down folk, guess what? Your folk going to get torn down or you going to get torn down. The apostle says, I pray that you may prosper in all of your endeavors. In everything you put your hands through. Everything you do, bless you. And everything that goes on around you, I pray that you prosper in all things. You know, I, I've never heard before till lately that people say, oh, they praying against you. Praying against you? First of all, if you're praying against me, it's not prayer. And the God that I serve will hear my prayer even if you pray against me. I told you a lady said to me, she said, she said, all I'm going to do is I'm going to get a picture of you and I'm going to voodoo you. I'm going to stop you from th that carrying on with that Bible. I'm going to voodoo you. I said, well, just stay here a minute. Let me go home and get a picture. I'll bring it back to you. Because the God that we serve is almighty, all-powerful, all-potent. We ought to worship him. And as we worship him, not the, not, the, not the devil in hell can make a difference. So we ought to pray for each other. We ought to surround each other in prayer. Because if you're not going through now, just wait a second or two. Just give it a second. It, it, it doesn't have to be before the night is over. It doesn't have to be in the morning. It doesn't have to be this week. But I'm telling you, just wait. You don't have to wait this week. You wait just a second. Something's going to happen. Because the devil is on his job. He's always doing what he want to do. When he want to do it, the devil is always on his job. And the only person that can stay the hand of the devil is God. When you look at Job, Job, Job just minding his own business, getting up early in the morning, praying for his children, offering up prayers for his children in case some of them have sinned. He's he was the most righteous man in the, the whole place of us. And he was doing his own thing. And he was a rich man. He had livestock. He he had a good wife, a good household. Then God stopped the devil. I said, God stopped the devil. God called a meeting with the devil. Have you considered my servant Job? The devil even recognized who Job was. The devil says, I can't touch him because you got a hedge of protection around. Lower the fence, lower the door, lower the hedge, lower it down where I can touch it. And don't you know the God we serve made a deal with the devil? <laughs> I know Job didn't like it and we don't like it either. I mean, children killed, livestock died. Then his wife started talking like a foolish woman. I didn't say she was a fool. I said she started talking like a foolish woman. Wife said, cuss God, lay down and die. <laughs> we ought to be praying for people. Even when God allows the devil to have a little bit more rope, it's our place to pray. So the apostle says, I'm praying for you. He says, Gainus, I'm praying that you will prosper. I'm praying that everything you touch, everything you breathe upon, everything that's concerning you, every endeavor you have, I am praying for you. I'm praying for you. Can you say that about your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? Can you say I'm praying for you? And really mean it. Not praying against, 
Not praying if, not praying if things go right for you, but honestly spending quality time in prayer. We have a prayer list here, right? And we, we, are, we are a church that's known for at least two things. Several things, but two spiritual things that our church is known for. Number one, we're known for prayer. Number two, we're known for evangelism. We're known for impacting the community. So those two things, prayer and evangelism is our trading card. That's how we are identified. I remember my brother said, said I went, and went over to Matt's church, and I don't see too much evangelism being shared there. The other preacher said, brother, I don't know what you're talking about. That's the evangelism guru over there. So he tried to give our church and, and me a bad name. And that's the other thing. We ought to pray for people because others will stand up for us when we are not there to stand up for ourselves. So he says, he says, I'm praying for you in all things. I'm praying for you in all your endeavors. I'm, I'm praying for you in all your spiritual work. And he says, I am praying for you that you be in health. One translation says that you will be in good health. So he's praying for him in everything. Then he identifies the physical. That you will be in good health. One of the things I do, I've chosen to do in premarital counseling is deal with the couple in how they handling their health. How are you doing with eating right, exercising right, sleeping right. Because being a spiritual person, you're born again, you're on your way to heaven anyhow. But you want to have prosperity while you're here. You want to be in good health. You want to be in good health. You want to be in good health. So he said, I'm praying for you that your physical body does not fail you. I'm praying that you be in good health. When you when you in a family, family members ought to pray that each other are in good health. Good health. Because you know you can have a thousand dollars here, you can have a million dollars there, you can have you can have a billion dollars. You can be the last winner of a billion dollar jackpot. But if you don't have good health, what does it mean? I'd rather have the health than have the money. Because if I got good health, I can get the money. Daddy used to say, boy, as long as you got a good strong back and a good set of hands, you can make some money. He said, just keep your back strong, keep your hands right, keep your mind in the right place. You can make money. You don't have to steal. He said, now, if you steal something, I come down there, they're gonna be you're going to beg them to keep you in there. You, you, you're not going to want to see me when I show up. Because there's no excuse for anybody taking anything that's not there. Nothing. So you, you ought to pray for your health. Pray that God keeps your health. And in your health, in your prayer, you ought to pray, God, keep my mind. Because if you have a strong body and not a good mind, you're worse off. God, keep my mind. Keep my mind. Keep my mind. A mind is a terrible Thing to waste. Keep your mind. Keep your mind. That's why we ought to be doing something with our mind on a regular basis so our mind can stay energized. And so John says, I'm praying for you that you be in, in health, in good health. He goes on to say, and I'm praying that you prosper even as your soul prospers. He compares the physical with the spiritual. And he says to us tonight, and, and in the church, we haven't gotten it yet. He says to us tonight that it's just in, as important for you to be physically healthy as it is for you to be spiritually healthy. It's important. It's important. Now, what, whatever that equates to, I don't know, because, see, they say you shouldn't eat pork and beef. But the bottom line is all the folk that's in their 80s and 90s, that's all they ate. So I don't know what your diet should be. 
And if you ask the 104-year-old woman, she'll say, the best thing I could have done to live this way and to get this age was that I treated everybody right. Treat people right. Treat people right. At, a, at Channel 13, ABC News, as Tom Abrams signed off at 1035 every night, he says, be kind to one another. Even the news reporter said, be begging us to be kind to one another. Every night at 1035, Tom Abrams signs off ABC, and he says, good night and be kind to one another. God is concerned about how well you carry yourself and how well you treat other people. God is concerned about the physical, the mental. He's concerned about the social. He's concerned about your emotions as he's concerned about your soul. You don't believe that? Questions are coming. You really believe that God is concerned about everything about you? Because John says... To gain us, he says, I'm praying for every portion of your life. And he says, I'm praying that you prosper even as your soul prospers. And he's a brother in the faith. He's a leader in the church. Here again, this, this elder this elder, the elder to the beloved gainers who is, whom he loved, this elder is a representative of one who has authority. He has authority and he has the ability to correct those in the church. Can anybody in the church correct you? Can anybody in the church set you down and say, look, baby, that ain't the way to do it. Can anybody in the church, a leader, a, a elder of the church, can anybody, any leader in the church set you down and say, now let's, let's try it God's way. Let's do it this way. Let's don't do it this way. Let's do it God's way. Because God is concerned about every act of your life. He says, for I rejoice greatly, verse number two, or verse number three, for I rejoice greatly when brethren, when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you. So he says, he says, I rejoice. I got excited. I was in approval of you because the brothers have given me a good report concerning you. First of all, folk watching you, you do know people are watching you. People are looking at you and they are giving good reports or bad reports. So Paul just gave a bad report on me just a few minutes ago. Now I'm going to tell it. <laughs> now it may be bad in my sight. It may not be so bad in her sight. I was walking out the door. She was sitting in her car outside. I was walking out the door minding my own business doing what I do. She's sitting in the car. She couldn't stand it see me walk out the door and walk out across the field. I was just walking out across the field. Brother Miles looking, looking at the fence, just see where they are, see how far they've been. What'd you say, Sister Paul? Where you going? I say, where you going? I said, Sister, we're not twins. That's why you went wrong. <laughs> I went wrong, brother, because I, I mean, it's like shitty cast. <laughs> Then she gets on the phone and call her son-in-law and tell her I'm talking to her wrong. There's a problem with that. So, so he says in, in verse number three, I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth in you. See, she should have been, should have been calling her son-in-law saying, now look, I got the greatest pastor in the world. I just love my pastor so much, and my pastor is walking in the word of God. He's walking in the truth. Now, Sister Woods, that would have been a lot better <laughs> than for her to try to sick a six-foot-five guy on me. 
Because I told her we weren't twins and we don't have to go everywhere together and you don't have to know everywhere I go. <laughs> so the testimony ought to be that we abide in the word of God. The testimony ought to be that we walk in the truth. The testimony ought to be that we don't stray from what God has asked us to do. Then we have a great testimony. Then God approves of us. And we ought to rejoice when we hear somebody with a great testimony. Just as you walk in the truth. Just as you walk in the truth, there ought to be somebody testifying of you walking in the truth. The testimony ought to be that they don't compromise the word. When I close my eyes for the last time, my tongue cleaves to the roof of my mouth. They fold my hand in service for the very last time. And you all go out and eat fried chicken and celebrate and think about it for a while. I pray that the testimony is he did not compromise the word of God. That he did not try to make people feel good. That he did not tickle itching ears, but he walked in the truth and he has a testimony that he's walking in the truth because we see him walking in the truth. That's my prayer. I pray that on that day when I'm stressed across for the last time that no one has to get up and lie for me. Because guess what? When you're living, they lie on you. When you're dead, they lie for you. A woman was sitting on the front row, had the two little children behind, beside her, and the preacher was just going on how great this man was in the casket and how he spent his time at the church and how he supported the church financially and how he did great things on behalf of God. The woman nudged the son and said, boy, go up there and see if that's your dad in that casket. <laughs> So why, 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 why did she have to say that? What? Because it wasn't true. So, so they would lie. Let me just testify right now. I ain't lying for none of y'all. I'm going to tell that same story how Sister Paul jumped on me in that parking lot if she leaves here before I leave here. I'm going to tell it to everybody. And we ought to be screaming during that time. But then I have to also testify of her faithfulness of her walking in the word, of her being a, word, a woman that's walking with the Lord. Because I'm not, I'm not I mean, we've had funerals that, that I couldn't find anything. Sister Brown, I couldn't find any. I looked through a haystack trying to find something good to, to pull out for the deceased. I looked, I looked, I looked in detail to try to find something. And guess what I came up with? Jesus died on Calvary. And he rose early that third day morning. I let somebody else do the lying or the eulogy. See, see, the eulogy means to speak well of. And if you're in the midst of a eulogy, you ought to be able to speak well of the deceased. But guess what? If the deceased doesn't give you anything to speak well of, you shouldn't get up and lie to make the family feel well. Because the family already know that you lie. Old folk back home said, you ain't got nothing good to say, sit down somewhere. Don't say anything at all. Just as you walked in the truth, people ought to testify of you walking in the truth. Verse 4. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. John talks about these children again. He's talking about those in the church, those that he has he has mentored those he has written to, those who have heard his words. He says that I get great joy out of this. Matter of fact, there is no greater joy. First, he says, I rejoice just by hearing it. Then he says, I get no greater joy than to know and to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Now, that is true for biological children and spiritual children. We get joy. 
When we see our children on Sunday morning and they're excited about the Lord and they demonstrate through their talents about the Lord, the whole church just erupt. Did you see it Sunday? I mean, the church goes to a different level when children present for the Lord. So this is true physically and spiritually. It is true congregationally and spiritually. So, so John says, there is no greater joy than to hear and to see and experience that my children, he's talking about those who he has mentored spiritually. He's talking about members of the church, the body of Christ. He said there's no greater joy than to know that you all are walking in the truth. I mean, it makes a pastor, it makes a bishop excited to know that I preach to this church and look at them how they're walking in the truth. I've taught them things. Look at them how they're walking in the truth. Let me tell you what I get excited about when preachers come to the pulpit and they try to use theological words. And the people at New Beginning already know these theological terms. Such as hyperstatic union. When guest preachers start talking about that, you already know that Jesus is just as much God as God and just as much man as man. There he is performing and presenting us the hyperstatic union. I get great joy when when preachers stands up and preachers stand up and they say, let me call you to this pericope and the people know where to go and know what he's talking about. I get great joy when the preacher start, the guest preacher start talking about the sovereignty of God. And you already know that God does what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, with whom he chooses to do it. And it's for his good. John says there's no greater joy in this <laughs> to know that the people he taught, the people that he talked to, the people that he's trained, the people who he has ministered to walk in the word of God. And the other thing is, you don't have to defend the word. You don't have to fight over the word. But the word apologetics means that you defend what you've been taught in the word. You don't have to argue over it. You just have to be solid in what you believe. Why we believe what we believe. So he says, regardless of how many false prophets have shown up, you have stood firmly. Gainus, you have stood firmly in the word of God. I've heard about it, and I get great joy about it. Matter of fact, I rejoice over it. Isn't that awesome? I mean, when, when, when I'm not here anymore, the church ought to move on down the road, and the church ought to have the godly principles that have been taught. I think it's a bad reflection on the teacher if the children, if the students don't learn. If you have to flunk 90% of your students, that's a problem. If you get bad grades to 75% of your students, the problem is not the students. The problem is the teacher or the professor. Why do I say that? Because it is your responsibility to come up with ways <laughs> by which people learn. And then you have to open yourself up and make yourself available for them to ask questions. That's why I'm concerned on Wednesday night when y'all don't ask any questions. <laughs> or when I don't get any answers. <laughs> or when I don't get any participation. I mean, my grade is falling when you don't participate. <laughs> and when I start talking about Sister Paul, then everybody participates. So they know how she is. I'm going to tell it all. She better, she better hope I leave here before she does. Verse number five. Behold, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for the strangers. He says, the word is out on you, Gainus. And we've come to the conclusion that whatever you do, you're not partial with what you do. 
Now, this is different from when John says, if a person brings to you anything other than this gospel, do not receive them into your house. This is different. What he's saying is, Gainus was one who welcomed strangers as well as those who preached and taught the gospel. He says, Gainus was one who was faithful in whatever he did. He was faithful. Boy, if we just had 10 faithful members, if we just had 25 faithful, if we just had 50 faithful members, Jesus took 12 men and turned the world upside down, and it was 11 of them that were faithful. The other one was a devil. If Jesus can take 12 men and turn the world upside down, we ought to be able to take 50, 75, 100 members, 300 members, and turn the world upside down. I mean, I've watched. I, I sit and I count the, no, the number of shootings, killings, robberies, burglaries, and it does not end until 1030. From 1030 to 1035, that's when they bring some good news. Check it out tonight. Check it out. They go 34 minutes. 34 minutes with bad news. Burglary, robbery, killing, child abuse, child abandonment. One after the other. And you are counting for 30 whole minutes this bad news. And then they spend the last five minutes talking about good news. And they go into the news report and says, only better note. Here we have good news. This servant of God is faithful. Let me tell you something. You need to be faithful, faithful to God, faithful to your church, Faithful to your ministry. You need to be faithful. You need to be faithful. You have to be faithful in order for God to say, well done, my good and faithful term. servant. How many of you want to hear, the servant, hear God say, well done, my good and faithful servant? How many of you? Raise your hand. If you want to hear God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now, let me tell you, if you're going to hear God say, well done, my good and faithful servant, you need to do well in order to hear well done. I'm in, I'm in, in third, third John, verse number five. Third John, verse number five. Beloved you do faithful, you do faithfully. Whatever you do, you do it faithfully. He says, and whatever you do, you do it for the brethren and you do it for the strangers. For many have entertained angels unaware. Third John, third John, in the back of the Bible, verse number five. Third John, verse number five. Beloved, you do faithfully Whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers. Then he goes on to say, who have borne witness of your love before the church. The, the brethren bear witness and the strangers bear witness. His name, you know, they used to say back home, when your name is on the highway. They were saying that your name is bad. I mean, that people are talking bad about you. But here we see Gainer's name is out there, is on the grapevine, and the thing that they're saying about him is good. He said that people have borne witness. They have borne witness of your love before the church. People in the church see that you, you are faithful. People in the church see that you're walking in love. People in the church see that you're honoring the word of God. People in the church sees that people in the church see that you are walking in the truth. 
if you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well. Remember now, he's talking about itinerary preachers that are passing through, itinerary preachers that are coming and teaching and preaching the word of God. Gainers has great hospitality. They don't do it anymore, but, but we used to have the preacher. Y'all know what take the preacher mean? Take the preacher, have the preacher? Anybody? Now, y'all from Louisiana, you know, you, know, you know what take the preacher mean, don't you? Take him home and feed him at the church. Take a preacher home and feed him at the church. They paid him at the church, and then they take him home and feed him. Especially when your church is a first and third or second and fourth, and the preachers travel from out of town. Don't send a man back home hungry. They would feed him. Now, as children, we had a problem with it because he come there and he sat there for three hours. And we waiting on him to get through before we eat. So that's how that's the conversation that's going on here. The preachers, the itinerary preachers, the preachers that are preaching from place to place, they come. And as they came, the people had hospitality. So he commands him that that people as they travel through, he's feeding them, he's supporting them. He's saying amen to his ministry. He, he's getting his coat. He's, he's doing things for him. He is very supportive of these itinerary preachers. And then he says, send them on their journey in a manner that's worthy of God. Remember, you are doing for God, not for the man of God. Blessed is the person that gives the man of God a drink of water. You are doing it for God. You don't, and don't let folk have you talking bad about the preacher. Folk will catch you in the parking lot and in the restroom. Girl, you know now, he put on his britches the same way I do. I tell him all the time, no, you don't. Because when you call me, sometimes I have to get a running start, stand my britches up and run and jump in them at the same, both legs at the same time. Because you want me there and you want me there right now. So no, I don't put them on the same way every time and the same way you put yours on. It depends on the urgency of the moment. Verse number seven. Because they went forth for his sake, for whose sake, for God's sake, taking nothing from the Gentile. In other words, God is depending on the people to minister to and to take care the man of God. The Bible says, do not muzzle the ox that shreds out the corn. A laborer is worthy of his hire. So he's commending Gainus. He's saying to Gainus, man, you have really been on top of it. You have done something because the preacher ought not look to the unsaved. To take care of him, he looked to you to take care of him. Isn't that something? Verse number eight, and I'm finished. We therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. In other words, receive the strangers. That's why I am so, I'm so so touched by our church and how we treat visitors. We ought to make them welcome, and I believe we do. We ought to make sure that people enjoy the moment, that coming to church is a great experience for people. We ought to make sure that our visitors see us and that visitors see us acting out of godliness. We ought to make sure that as people come in and out of the doors or people meet us on the street, they know we are Christian. Jesus says they will know that you are my disciples by the love you show one to the other. And here John says not only did he show the love, did Gainer show the love to the brethren, the believers, he also showed the love to strangers. That's why, that's why we... 
we ought to love on people. It says we ought to receive them because there's a possibility that one day they will become fellow workers for the truth. Can you believe that it's a possibility that some of the greatest evangelists of all time has not been saved, have not been saved yet? Dope dealers that will come into the fold, they're not going to be scared like we are. They'll go right back out there and they will minister to those prostitutes that are walking the streets. They're, they're not scared like many church folk are. They go right back out there and bring those in that are just like them or just like they have been. God is looking forward to us having hospitality in such a way that people feel welcome, that people can rejoice. Because guess what? One of these days, one little child that we minister to, one day may become a fellow workman for the truth. One of these days, one person that's walking the street selling their body will become a, a, a saved person that will work for the truth. I know children are confused. They don't know what's going on. And the world is, is pumping stuff in them every day. And guess what? One of those days, they can come to Christ and be ministers for Christ. You know, I, I hear people make the statement all the time. You never know what this child can become. And that's true. You never know what God is putting in somebody. You never know what God is dealing with somebody. You never know what people are going through. So the Bible says, John says, Gainus, I thank you, man. Gainus, I rejoice with you. Gainus, I have no greater joy than the fact that you have hospitality one to the other, even with strangers. See, the problem with some church folk, they only like church folk. They only have hospitality toward church folk. Paul, uh, John says to us today, make sure you entertain strangers with hospitality. You love on people. Make sure that people are loved by you and they know that they are loved by you. He says, whatever you do, continue to exemplify love. I know the children we have today got off a different truck. I mean, they, they fell off a different truck. But we got to show them love. We got to show them love. I heard a testimony of a football player that never thought anybody loved him. And then he was watching football one day and he decided he's going to run just like Walter Payne. And he ended up in the NFL. He thought no one loved him because his mama was a drug addict and she died from doing drugs. But on her deathbed, she said to him, keep the family together. So after he became a football star, he kept the family together. He kept them all in one house. He kept them all together. Even a dying woman that's dying from drugs knew that love would make a way. That's what God did over 2,000 years ago. Love made a way. See, we can't love the unlovable on our own, but Jesus died that we can love the unlovable. Jesus died. He was buried. He rose from the dead so that we can love the unlovable. And that same Jesus is available tonight. Why don't you join me in prayer? Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you, Father, for the truth. We thank you for the word. We thank you, Father, for blessing us. We thank you, Lord, for a testimony of someone walking in the word, walking in truth, walking in the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, bless us to be godly examples, that we will always walk in the word, that others will see the word, that we will have hospitality toward mankind, both believers and strangers. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory, all the honor and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to come to Jesus just as you are. This is your moment. If you never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, 
you can do so right here, right now. You can receive Jesus, believe in the story that over 2,000 years ago he died on a skull hill called Calvary. That they killed him and laid him in a borrowed tomb. And early that third day morning he rose from the dead. Will you trust that tonight and invite Jesus into your life? If you want to do that, you can just repeat after me and invite him in right now. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We believe if you prayed this prayer, we believe that you're born again and you're on your way to heaven when you leave here. And we believe that because you're on your way to heaven, you need to pull somebody along with you. And so we need to be praying for each other. We need to be looking out and reaching out for each other. So much so that people will come to know Jesus Christ. During our prayer time, we'll be praying for Costino and the Costino family and the Garza family during their moment of bereavement. We'll be praying for Sister Doris Brisfort and Sister Lydia Darrington for healing. And of course, we'll be, we're going to be praying for students, school, doctors, lawyers, praying for principals, superintendents praying for general labors. We're praying for protection. And as we move forward throughout our day, we gotta lift up our students, lift up our children. The devil is on a rampage. And we have to make sure that our students are where they're supposed to be, when they're supposed to be there. And we need to lift them up before the Lord. And we wanna lift these. Father God, we come now, we thank you, Lord. We Bless your name. We pray for those on our prayer list. We ask you to bless those who are not on our prayer list. Lord, we ask you to heal and touch as only you can. Lift the bowed down heads of, of those who are bereaved. We ask you, Father God, to bless those who are sick and heal as only you can. We pray for young people. We ask you to give them favor. We ask you to wipe out the confusion. We pray, Father God, as they go in and out of schools, we pray for protection. We pray, Father God, for healing. Bless this generation, Lord, that this generation will come back to you, that the killing and stealing will stop, that they will always be about your business, Bless, Father God, that they will be living godly examples that we can rejoice over and brag about. Bless their minds, bless their heart, and bless them to be of great success. Bless them to prosper even as their soul prospers. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is now offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It is time to give to the Lord. Hallelujah. We rejoice because we are excited about giving to the Lord. If you want to give electronically, you can do so by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Or you can mail in your gift. Your, your gift can be mailed in to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. 
Father God, we thank you for this privilege of giving. We thank you for every giver. We ask you to bless every gift. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us stand to be dismissed. Our mission and vision statement. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, In I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. Father God, we thank you for this night. We ask you to bless us in our going, keep us safe, keep us, our hearts and our mind. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, amen. Amen. God bless you and God keep you.